in their own ministry and for us. Well, when we begin thinking about who might speak to us this year, I set uh, for staff these criteria. It needed to be a disciple minister, serving vibrant ministry, known to be an extraordinary pastor and preacher. And we started looking for and asking around who might that be. And the name that consistently came to me from a variety of sources was Katie Hayes, our speaker this morning. Now I must tell you that when she and I first spoke, neither of us, of us knew the other. I'd never seen her, I'd never spoken with her. And so you might appreciate that she, would, she asked the appropriate question. Why me? Well, here's roughly what I said. I've got to do this, I have to read this, because this is roughly what I said. We always seek the best possible speaker. One who would inspire, one who would share important insight, one who would offer a reason for you all to get up at seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and by all accounts, she was our best choice. Now that sounds like promotion, doesn't it? Pretty good line, right? And perhaps at the time it might have been. Uh, but I had the opportunity to hear her speak uh, a couple of months ago uh, at uh, Pepperdine University for their Bible lectures. And I came away thinking, wow, we have made the right choice. Not a good choice, the right choice. And as you can see in the program, uh, she has been nurtured in her Christian faith in the Church of Christ. Became one of the few women in pulpit in the Church of Christ. Which probably was not a comfortable place at times. Probably not. She served 19 years in ministry uh, with her husband, sometimes jointly in the pulpit. Serving in Alabama, Georgia, New York, in Texas, and most recently as senior minister of the Northwest Christian Church in Arlington, Texas. Now, after I first started researching who she might be, I went on the website and I saw the website for Arlington Christian Church in, or the Northwest Christian Church in Arlington, Texas. And I spent about a half hour just going through all of the events and what it, what it was saying, what it was doing to invite people in. And I told my wife, I could go to church there. That's a good church. And she just recently left to form a new faith community. She tells me it's called Galileo for millennials because we're not the center of the earth or the universe. Well, as a baby boomer, I don't understand that at all. But, <laughs> but I want to thank you, Katie, for accepting the invitation. I know that it is an important message that you bring today. I pray God's blessing on you and your ministry. And I pray that God's voice God's voice shines through this morning in your message. Katie Hayes. Seven a.m., are you kidding me? All I can say is you folks must be hungry for the gospel. There was some confusion over these last months whether Jim had invited me here to talk or to preach. I tell you what, I'm going to talk, and if the Holy Spirit shows up, we're going to call that preaching. <laughs> and to give ourselves a fighting chance, why don't we begin with a reading from the Gospel? We'll start with Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. 
And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were at table with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Matthew closed his eyes and massaged his forehead with his fingers. He could feel the crease between his eyebrows, the furrow as deep as the Wadi Kishon, the permanent tension that made his wife ask every single day if he was okay as she tried to kiss it away. Every day he said, yeah, he was okay offering her a tight little smile as he left the house to take his shift in the booth by the road that led in and out of town on the west side. Every night he came back and he knew that she knew that the furrow was a little deeper, the headache a little more insistent, the weight of this life a little heavier than it had been the day before. He had never meant for it to go like this. He hadn't really done anything wrong. He just wanted to provide for his family. And he found that he, he didn't have the stomach for the ups and downs of farming or fishing. You know, sowing the seed and then waiting, waiting, waiting through the summer, hoping, hoping, hoping for rain and sun in the right proportions, praying, praying, praying that the Lord would see fit to make a crop this year. Or dropping the anchor and waiting, waiting, waiting through the night, hoping, hoping, hoping that the fish were running, praying, praying, praying that the Lord would fill the nets. Matthew just wasn't the waiting, hoping, praying kind. He just wasn't wired that way. He wanted a job, <laughs> a paycheck. So we went to work for Rome, collecting tolls from travelers on the Capernaum Cana route. It seemed like a good idea at the time. It wasn't the snarls of the strangers that bothered him. You know, people came in and out by the hundreds all day, every day, carrying out loads of fish, carrying in loads of everything else. And if they muttered under their breath when he announced the entry and exit fees, what did he care? They were using the roads that Rome paved. They could pay the taxes that Rome imposed. It was only fair. But about every 20th person at the booth was someone he knew, or someone his parents had known, or someone he used to sit in synagogue with, someone who had come to his wedding, friends, former friends, given that his line of work had set him at odds with everybody he knew. A couple buddies from school had tried early on to get him to relax the regulations, you know, let him pass without paying, but Matthew was going to do this job right. And anyway, there were Roman guards posted right there to guard Caesar's cash. What did they expect? So he lost friends. The furrow between his eyebrows deepened. He went home at the end of every day a little more detached from, a little more disappointed in the community that had raised him to adulthood, only to find that they didn't like the kind of adult he had become. He had even heard recently that he was Exhibit A in a sermon series on 99 ways your life could go horribly wrong. <laughs> Probably not the actual title, but it could have been. And no, no, he wasn't mentioned by name, but apparently it was becoming homiletically fashionable to impugn him and everybody like him for the way they made their living. Tax collectors, the preacher would hiss, the X and the S stretched out. And Matthew imagined the congregation hissing right along. 
He could only imagine, because he hadn't been to synagogue in a long time. It was a lot easier to spend the Sabbath in bed, just whispering guilty prayers toward the heavens, half hoping that God really wasn't paying any attention at all, than it was to walk into the sanctuary and watch his neighbors part like the Red Sea to avoid being seen with him. So there sat Matthew collecting disapproval and disappointment and distaste along with Rome's taxes, losing his religion day by day. And that's how Jesus found him, fingers to the forehead, trying to massage the pain away. And who really knows what happened next? I mean, we know what happened next, next. Follow me, Jesus said, and Matthew up and went. But I mean, between the headache and the discipleship, in that moment of transformation from heartsick tax collector to true believer, what was that? That's what the Pharisees wanted to know, too. Now, listen, we are not going to hiss out Pharisees the way they might have hissed out tax collectors because just between you and me, my spouse and I just finished paying off our student loans last December. Best Christmas ever. <laughs> yeah, you can just, yeah, thanks. You can just process that for a minute. I'm 44, because I know you're doing the math. That is way too long of a relationship with Sally Mae. And it surely puts me right up there in pharisaical territory in terms of theological education and ecclesiastical snobbery. So we are going to say Pharisee with respect for these men who had devoted their lives to one thing and one thing only, knowing what God wants. And another thing, telling other people what God <laughs> wants. <laughs> it's a dangerous business, but it's respectable, right? Because that's what we do, most of us here. It's way better than working for the man, like Matthew. So, like us, the Pharisees were curious to know what makes someone like Matthew walk away from his security. Matthew follows Jesus, the Pharisees follow Matthew, and pretty soon the whole lot of them end up at a rather spontaneous shindig at Matthew's place. And here I would just like to pause and give credit to his resourceful and generous spouse who no doubt had a furrow between her eyebrows by the end of the night, what with a house full of all the riffraff Jesus had been collecting all day long tax collectors, sinners, pretty much everybody who'd been named in last Saturday's sermon. There, with Jesus and his regulars breaking the bread, drinking the wine, rocking the house. We don't understand, the Pharisees said, quite reasonably, to a couple of the Galileans who'd been traveling with Jesus for a while, who'd gone outside for a smoke. If he needs people, why doesn't he come to us? Why them? And why does he eat with them? One of them actually threw up a little in his mouth at the thought of it. <laughs> if they had known about Jesus' preternatural sense of hearing, they might have moved that conversation a little further up the street. But as it was, Jesus overheard and swiveled on his cushion to address the party crashers through the open portico. <laughs> you know what you need to do, he said? You need to go back to school. Get an education. You think you know what God wants? You need to get the books, boys. I think you slept through the one on the minor prophets. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Hosea 6.6, 6, look it up, then come back, we'll talk. <laughs> now, maybe I'm projecting here because it's not actually reported in scripture, but in my mind, at least four of those Pharisees had just finished paying off their student loans in December. <laughs> 
And Jesus' suggestion that what they needed was more school, more learning, more study of the scriptures they had practically memorized was just not cool. They had multiple degrees hanging on their walls already. Their mothers were very proud of them already. They knew what God wanted already. Go and learn what this means. <laughs> what could he possibly mean by that? Go and learn what this means. Hmm. What could he possibly mean by that? The Pharisees left in a worried confusion, the furrows between their eyebrows deepening, the headache from which Matthew had apparently been liberated settling into their own temples. I was 20, maybe 21 years old the semester I threw up in my theology class. Actually, I made it to the break in the middle of the three-hour lecture. I hustled down the hall to the bathroom, lost my lunch, and then hustled back to class. I did not want to miss a minute. My professor was introducing the life and work of Albert Schweitzer, that early 20th century polymath who studied, among so many other things, the life and work of Jesus and the interpretation of Jesus in the Gospels. My professor had introduced to us the phrase historical Jesus in the first hour of class, and it made my stomach go 246. Because if Dr. Schweitzer was on to something, and he surely was, then I was going to have to trade in my Jesus, the handsome one with a supernatural glow around his head, the doe-eyed Anglo, with a silky voice, gorgeous hair, and a wise, comforting personality, the one who glided fearlessly toward the cross to atone for my sins without his feet ever really touching the ground. You know, religious Jesus. He would have to go, and I would have to adjust to, uh, well, let's just call him real Jesus the apocalyptic prophet whose heart burned with God's holy fire, a voice hoarse from shouting, feet and toes gnarly from schlepping the countryside, trying to get critical mass for his transformational project. This Jesus was frustrated and lonely. This Jesus was poor and powerless. This Jesus was just doing his best with what he had and getting clobbered for his trouble. This Jesus was a human being an actual guy from an actual place at an actual time and all that actuality suddenly mattered and my stomach did flip-flops and my head swam and I was sick and it was glorious. It was glorious because right up until then I was pretty sure I knew what God wanted, and I was pretty sure it was not me. I had recently been asked politely to leave the Christian university where I had been studying because they could not allow women to study theology. It was the first step of many in a long journey away from the denomination of my youth and my family. And I had found this tiny theological school for refugees that would let me study and read and learn, but still would not let me pray aloud in mixed company. From that vantage point, I could not see, I could not imagine a future in which my life, my whole self, would be a welcome addition to the church. A church. Any church. But on this afternoon, my professor was suggesting ever so gently 
that Jesus himself was perhaps not exactly who we had imagined him to be over all these centuries, that perhaps layers of our own ideas of religiosity had accreted on our collective memory of him. And on this afternoon, I was beginning to wonder if maybe the cleaned off Jesus, or rather the sweaty, sunburned, Semitic Jesus, might be making a place for me at his table alongside all those other losers he picked up along the way. I could squeeze in beside Matthew there. Right beside Matthew, if that other tax collector would just scoot over a little. First, I'd run outside and throw up real quick, and my... <laughs> my headache, my heartache, would begin to disappear. Jim Hamlet asked me to talk this morning about the practices that renew and strengthen my life of ministry, one of which, I must tell you, is a firm commitment to never subject myself to preaching at 7 in the morning. <laughs> but... But after he declined my counter-suggestion that perhaps we could break with the 100-year tradition and enjoy a nice pension fund brunch, <laughs> these are the stories that bubbled up concerning renewal and strength in service of our work. Stories of relief and nausea, sometimes in the same person at the same time, upon learning anew that God is not exactly who we thought God was. It was hilarious and thrilling that Jesus tells the learned Pharisees to go and learn what this means, as if he fully expects that there is always more learning to do, a perpetual necessity to keep one's nose stuck in a book. Among their several objections, the Pharisees probably wondered when they were supposed to find time to go and learn, what with all the other temple business with which they were occupied. I wonder if the congregants of their day were any more supportive than our own when it comes to the quiet hours behind closed doors that such an enterprise would require. I wonder if the preachers of their day were any more protective than we of the precious hours it would require to remain the active scholars we all once were. When I started working on my doctorate of ministry a bunch of years ago, the librarian at our school gave us a tour of the prodigious stacks, and as we walked through the aisles, he told us a cautionary tale. Every year, I get 10 or 12 calls from the widows of our alumni, he said, as his fingers brushed the spines of the volumes in his care. They're ready to clean out their spouse's studies, and they figure there's no better place than their alma mater's library to donate all those books. And he stops to look at us over his glasses. So I drive out to the widow's house, he says, and after a glass of iced tea, she invites me to see the collection. And in 10 minutes' time, I can tell you the exact year that pastor received his MDiv because <laughs> that's the last year he read a serious scholarly work of theology or biblical studies, ethics or history, any book worthy of the shelf space in a seminary library. Go and learn, Jesus said to the Pharisees, and so said the librarian to me. And Jesus' syllabus was specific. Go and learn what this means, he said. And he gave the abundantly learned Pharisees an explicit assignment. Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. God, that is, desires chesed, the kind of love that seeks to embody one's own deep commitment to a relationship with one who may not love you back. Steadfast love, we usually translate from the Hebrew. Mercy, we get from the Septuagint because they struggled to find a word in the super-rational Greek that would connote how essential, how necessary for life this love is for the one being loved. 
Go and learn what this means, Jesus said. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, love, not ritual, chesed, and not adherence to a system of rules, steadfast love, essential and necessary regard for the one standing right in front of you, standing in the need of love, not an overdeveloped sense of how to cross the doctrinal T's and dot the religious I's. I desire mercy, our God said once through the prophet and again through the Messiah, not sacrifice. Go and learn what this means, Jesus said to the Pharisees. And Matthew and I were listening from our places at the table watching in amazement while the religious gatekeepers who had roped us out for so long walked away to ponder what this could possibly mean. <laughs> Laughing behind our hands because we already knew, Matthew and I, we already knew. It meant that God's answer to our heartsick prayers was yes had always been yes, would always be yes. Only now we had ears to hear. Someday Matthew would write all this down so that his progeny would have a record of the day God in Christ showed the world a new thing, and that new thing was Matthew follower of Jesus, welcome recipient of the Hesed God desires above all else. Someday I would tell my own story of all the ways God showed me a new thing and that new thing was myself, my whole self, received and cherished through the mercy of Christ and the disciples of Christ. And isn't that what we want? We who move for wholeness in a fragmented world. For more and more stories like Matthew's, like mine, to be added to our collective witness to the mercy that God desires above all else. 